Welcome into the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice, and this is episode number 21. 21 episodes. We thank you for listening, for subscribing and liking us on YouTube and all the other places you can listen to us. There's a lot. There's a lot. We're out there, and we're nationwide and worldwide, and uh, it's amazing some of the countries that people are listening to us in. We do appreciate that. We have a great show today. Mike Watchmaker is going to join us in just a few moments from the Daily Racing Forum. Uh, of course, he always does the Derby Watch. He keeps up with, uh, well, he keeps up with everything. He's one of the top handicappers around. We're going to get his take on what has been a crazy Triple Crown season that just came to an end last week. And later on, uh, I had the chance to work with him. I hadn't known him until now uh, in the last uh, two months. Ahmed Farid of uh, NBC. In the past, he's worked for, among others, the Major League Baseball Network. He's a sports guy. This was his induction into horse racing this year on the Triple Crown scene. So I just want to kind of get his take, and we talked about it, uh, his take on horse racing in general and what he thought about it all. And there's never been a Triple Crown season like we just had. And, uh, of course, highlighted or low-lighted, depending on how people look at it, by the Kentucky Derby. And the first time ever that the winner of the Kentucky Derby on the track was disqualified and taken off from first place. And that, of course, was uh, maximum security. And it still is when and where is he going to run again? It looks like the Haskell in New Jersey uh, this summer. And, of course, Country House won that race. And then the unseating of jockey John Velasquez got as much attention as the win of War of Will, who was impressive in the Preakness. And now we cap it off with a crazy Belmont where we had Sir Winston, who Mark Cassie said was not even, uh, you know, one of the tops in his stable, which was obviously War of Will was. But yet it's Sir Winston coming in to pull a surprise to cap off a surprising, interesting, controversial season of the Triple Crown like we've never seen before. I don't know if we're going to see it again uh, anytime soon. Uh, maybe somebody else will be doing one of these podcasts in the next 15 years, and they'll be talking about it. And maybe they'll be smart enough to have Thomas Kenny as their researcher who'll be said, no, you're, you're way ahead of that. You'll be off making money. Ben Chaffins <laughs> will be making money. Scott Hall will retire. He'll be on a beach somewhere. I'll be saying, yeah, I remember. I was there in 2019. Yeah. They'll have me on doing that. So, Thomas, interesting year. It's not the first time it's happened, but it doesn't happen that often. Uh, when you had Mark Cassie train two horses that won the Triple Crown races. Of course, War of Will and the Preakness, and then Sir Winston comes back to win the Belmont, and it just doesn't happen every day. No, it's pretty uncommon as far as horse racing goes. You know, obviously, if you win a Triple Crown, you've won at least two races, right? <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, outside of Triple Crown winners, there really haven't been that many people who've won more than one leg of a Triple Crown in the same year. I believe, let's see, going back to Wayne Lucas in the mid-90s, Todd Pletcher had done it with two different horses. Lucas had done it a couple of times, I think, with two different horses. He actually won all three legs of the 95 Triple Crown with <laughs> different horses. Well, yeah, he's, he's the king. Lucas did all that, and then... Uh, and then, of course, uh, Cassie does it this year. But you've done some pretty good research there. You threw some names at me that I'd almost forgotten about, even though it hasn't been that far back of guys that won two legs of the Triple Crown. Well, obviously, Bob Baffert. Yeah. He's won yeah. two Triple Crown races in yeah. the same year. Just throw Baffert out. It's always Not once, not twice, but five times. He's won twice. Wow. That's amazing. Obviously, American Pharaoh and Justify yeah. took all three races in their respective years. We also had the likes of Silver Charm. Yeah. Real Quiet. Yeah. And what was the third one? I see. War Emblem. War Emblem. That's right. You know, he lost those two races right at the end. They were just nipped. I mean, he was within a, he's less than a second away from winning two more Triple Crowns. That's fascinating. If you look back on that Silver Charm race in 97 and Real Quiet in 98, He's like eyelashes away from winning four Triple Crowns. Uh, that's why I think he's the greatest ever. And then War Emblem, we talk about start to finish, how important it is. And they'll say, well, a mile and a half race. You know, the start doesn't always matter. If you look back on War Emblem in that 2002 uh, Belmont, uh, basically when he comes out of the gate, he almost face plants. Uh, he stumbled and, you know, his race was over before it began, really. So that's the importance even at a mile and a half. I saw somebody do that on NBC where they talked about that and they held up a, some sand from the track. Oh, that was me. 
That was me. <laughs> Never mind. He said it can slip through your fingers quickly if the jockey makes a wrong move early or something happens early in the race. You, you had some other names in there, guys that I know that I, you know, you, you know it, but you go, ah, oh, yeah, that's a good reminder. I forgot about that. We'll go ahead and pull up my notes here for those of you listening to us on uh, Google Play and iTunes. And those watching us can see that's a nice shirt you got on. New Thank shirt? You. Yeah, relatively. Yeah, look, looks good. Looks good. Scott, you you guys got new shirts on today, you and Ben? Um, mine's pretty old. It's still <laughs> nice, though. We're very clean here, at least. That's right. It's a clean group. That's right. We all wore black today, or dark colors. I well, don't know. I, if I'd gotten the memo, I would have gone with that. I went with the blue again. I like blue. It's a good color. It is a good color. My blue. personal favorite. Thank you. It seems to go with my eyes. Very dapper. Okay, so so what do we have from the two, uh, some of the others? No, we're not, you know, we're not going to go through the litany of them, but we got a couple others in there. They're kind of interesting guys. Well, obviously, you've got your triple crown winning trainers like uh -huh. Lucian Lauren with Secretariat, yeah. Jimmy Jones with Citation, yeah, going all the way back to 1919. Guy Bedwell with Sir Barton. They didn't even know it was a triple crown back then, did they? No, that was the thing. It was in the 30s, and uh, Chicago sports writer, I believe. I'll look that up, and we'll talk about that in a future show. He coined the phrase triple crown because at that time, it was no big deal. They were all a separate entity. Nobody, you know, okay, maybe I'll win the Derby. Maybe I'll run again. Maybe not. Maybe I'll win the Preakness, whatever. Uh, and the, the classic example is Man of War. He won the Preakness in Belmont. Didn't even He never even ran in Kentucky. And yeah, because it just didn't matter back then. They didn't think of the triple crown. And then when Sir Barton won all three legs, somebody said, hey, I don't think that's ever been done. And it hadn't been in 1919. Mm -hmm. I covered that year. I remember it well. That was after Donnerell. That was after Donnerell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was there for Donnerell and Country House, the two biggest long shots in Derby history. Yes, <laughs> I've seen it all, folks. That's why we do this show. Right. It's funny you say that Man of War never ran in Kentucky because I drive Man of War Boulevard to get to this studio every day. Interesting. There's Man of War Boulevard, a Man of War statue at the Kentucky uh, Horse Park. People think Man of War. They think Kentucky. But that's a great, we talked about that before, it's a great bar bet, great lunch bet. Hey, uh, hey, tell me the year that he won the Kentucky Derby. How many times did he race in Kentucky? And, you know, do you get it right? Buy me a burger. He never raced, so that's that's the trick. And the race he lost, he lost to a horse at Saratoga named Upset. Fitting. There, see? All right. I think we, let's see, you mentioned some other, like Richard Dutrow with Big Brown. Mm -hmm. Big Brown. Art Sherman with California Chrome. Yeah, Doug O'Neill with I'll Have Another. And, of course, he didn't even run in the Belmont because of injury. Right. So uh, it, it, is, it is a special feat. And I think that's the highlight of the year. The positive thing of the year is Mark Cassie who handled everything so graciously with some controversy in the Derby and then won the last two legs of the Triple Crown with two different horses. And I would add to that Bill Mott, who won the Kentucky Derby with Country House. He handled that controversy well uh, with class. And he had Tacitus, who was third in the Derby and second in the Belmont Stakes. And they're both have been on the show, and they're both really class acts. And in a year that's been nuts for horse racing, which we'll talk more about later, uh, that's been the highlights. It's always good to end on a positive note, right? Yeah, at least that's it. And, of course, there's racing this summer. Most people, people listening to this show will know that. Although I really appreciate some of the email and, and the comments we get from people that listen to this show to kind of get a broad base of horse racing. Mm -hmm. They're going to be probably like uh, Ahmed Farid, who will join us in a few minutes. Uh, you know, they, they are sports fans. Right. You know, they've keeping up with the Stanley Cup and the NBA Finals, and they've also watched the Triple Crown. And that's, I think that's a good audience. And that's what horse racing needs to build on, to yeah. be honest. They, they need to reach out and bring in that other fan base out there because it's a limited fan base nationwide for horse racing. Yeah, Kenny, do you think that the, you know, this year being the controversy, kind of the crazy year, I think it's going to lead to an exciting year, year next year, actually. Yeah, I, I do. I do, Scott. Yeah. And to be honest, the controversy's brought in a lot of the interest. Yeah. It's brought in a lot of the interest to horse racing that, uh, wouldn't have been there before. We had a big audience on NBC, an audience as big as if there'd been a spectacular win in the Kentucky Derby, if Secretariat-like win in the Kentucky Derby, because everyone was waiting around for those 21 minutes and 57 seconds to see who was going to be named the winner. Everybody likes controversy. That's right. Kevin Durant. Everybody went, well, is he going to come back? Okay, he comes back. Now he hurts his Achilles. But he came back, and the Raptors won, or rather the, um, 
uh, Golden State won, and they kept the series going. And, you know, that's the kind of – that's what people build on, and they talk about it for days. And that's – they've talked about this year's Triple Crown and probably will for a few more days. When we come back, Mike Watchmaker of the Daily Racing Forum right here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. Welcome back into the Horse Racing Show. Glad that you're tuning in on YouTube or listening to us on your iPad or following us on Google Play, wherever. You follow this man if you want to know what's happening in sports and the uh, horse racing scene. He is Mike Watchmaker of the Daily Racing Forum. It's a must to keep up with his derby watch to see who's in place to go to Churchill Downs. And from there on throughout the rest of the year, the best older horses, uh, the younger horses coming up. Uh, Mike is one of the top handicappers. And I always like him because he has an opinion and he's a great guy. And he joins us now. Mike, thanks for being on. I'm blushing, Kenny. You can't see it, but I'm blushing. Thank you very much. Oh, geez. Now I'm blushing. Oh, geez. Now I'm on camera. I'm looking away. I don't want people to see us. <laughs> We're like the Osmonds all of a sudden, aren't we? I know. I know. Too much love in the air. Let's, Too, let's fix that. Do you realize all the trainers and jockeys that listen to this show, and there's several that come up to me and tell me they listen to it, they just now said, what? You and Mike Watchmaker are blushing? We don't believe it. Yeah, well, a lot of those guys probably don't like me, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> what I always like, like I say, you got an opinion. I love people to have an opinion, and not only that, they back it up. I hate the thing when somebody says, well, I like this. Don't you hate when somebody asks you, hey, who do you like? And then you tell them, and they go, do you, really? Well, no, I just told you. Don't ask me. If you, just don't ask me. You don't need, the, I had a buddy that called me and said, who do you like in the, in the Belmont? I gave him three horses, and none of them were uh, Sir Winston. And so he sends me a note back like two days later and says, hey, I hit the triple. I talked to this other guy, he loves Sir Winston. Well, then don't even call me anymore. Why are you asking me? I, I learned a long time ago, Kenny, that never trust a public handicapper who doesn't bet. I mean, you, you just can't trust them. So uh, uh, I bet. That's why I'm still working for a living. But that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you look at this uh, triple crown season, uh, Mike, I don't know if we're ever going to see anything like it again. And I'm not talking about just the winners, but all the crazy things that happen, unseated, uh, you know, John Velasquez, and obviously all the things that happened in the Derby. And we cap it off with the horse that I don't think Mark Cassie even thought was one of the top two or three in his stable. Well, you know, if we don't see another Triple Crown season like this, uh, it would be okay with me. Because <laughs> uh, it was, I don't think it was a particularly strong one. Um, I had reservations about this group from a very early point right. and uh jay Priven and i actually talked about it jay uh, of course is the national correspondent for daily racing form he's my derby watch partner um and we you know we we kind of talked about it uh very early on before we even put out the first derby watch of the year and uh that we were concerned about the overall quality of this group and and it seems to have borne itself out uh, you know uh, a horse who, who was who was risked for a sixteen thousand dollar claiming tag by some of the sharpest people in the country, uh, you know, finishes first in the Kentucky Derby and then is disqualified rightfully. Uh, then a horse uh, who was bought in the Derby wins the Preakness with an absolute perfect Golden Rail trip, uh, and then you've got another track by a situation the Belmont Stakes. I mean, uh, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The rail was absolutely the place to be at Belmont. There's just no question about it. If you're watching the main track races, you just have to see that. And um, Sir Winston saved ground around both turns and uh, only moved out to go around a couple of horses in the stretch, whereas Tacitus uh, was at least five wide all the way around the racetrack. And, you know, even in a, in, in a non-biased situation, that kind of ground loss made the difference. There was only a length between Sir Winston and Tacitus at the finish. But when you factor in the bias, it's very clear that Tacitus was, was the best horse in the Belmont. So you've, you've got a, a couple of inconclusive results and a, and a perfect trip, um, a biasated winner right in the middle of them. It was, it was a messy triple crown and the three-year-old division is still wide, wide open. Yeah. I don't know who is the best three-year-old right now. Would it be Tacitus maybe? Well, I, I'm Maybe. glad that we don't have to. We don't have to, you know, say who. I mean, we can we can opine. Yeah. But I'm glad we don't have to vote right now. Yeah, me too. I wouldn't. You know, I, I'd have a hard time 
voting. I mean, in my watch maker watch on DRF.com, which I update every week, I've got Omaha Beach on top yeah. because I thought he was the best three-year-old I've seen this year. And I, I think it's just terribly unfortunate for him and his connections that, you know, that, that throat issue really, really surfaced uh, just days before the Derby and forced him to be scratched a Derby in which he would have been favored. Uh, and I, to me, you know, his Arkansas Derby and his uh, division of the Rebel wins were the best performances by three by a three year old this year. And that's why I have him on top. I'm maximum security. I've got second because he did finish first in the Derby and no horse has finished in front of him. And I got Tacitus third because at least he ran well in two of the three legs of the uh, of the Triple Crown. I mean, he was moved up to third in the Derby on the disqualification of maximum security. And I thought he was clearly best in the Belmont. Let me get back because you mentioned the Derby, and, and uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but I haven't had a chance to do an interview with you. And uh, what what about that Derby? Were you surprised? Did you think maximum security during this 21 minute and 57 second, I believe, is the official time on it, Mike? Good gracious. I, it's funny. People come up to me and start telling me the time of the, the time that elapsed between the crossing the line and the decision made. It seemed like, you know, it was like two hours when I'm out there, you know, interviewing Bill Mott and and thinking this thing's not going to end. But were you surprised at the at the outcome of the Derby, the decision of the Derby? No, I was not. Um, and uh, if, if uh, as you say, Kenny, if it, if, if it was 21 minutes to come to that decision, if it was the uh, 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 a maiden claimer in the first race at Pocolodi Downs, it would have <laughs> taken six minutes. Yeah. Uh, because it was a clear foul. And, and, and I think the reason why it took so long is because the stewards understood the the gravity of the situation uh, and the historical precedent that they would be setting. And they also wanted to be sure exactly where they were going to put maximum security, because he did not only interfere with uh, uh, um, uh, War of Will, but he interfered with two other horses. And so it was a matter of determining, you know, whether you would put it behind all three horses who were affected uh, by uh, maximum security uh, coming out sharply uh, late on on the far turn, and so you know I think all of that is is the reason why it took that long. Uh, but I think any seasoned horse player, right. handicapper, um, had to expect this horse to come down and, and understood that if it was any other race, it was an absolute no prater. And the only reason why there was seemed to be some agonizing over it is because it had never happened before in the Kentucky Derby. And you'd hate to take away a Kentucky Derby from a horse uh, like Maximum Security, who, as the race was run, was best despite what he did on the far turn. Right. And you hate to give it to a horse in Country House who is really just lucky and in the right place at the right time. But to his credit, he ran well enough to be in the right place at the right time to inherit the win. Um, you hate to have America's most popular horse race decided that way, but but you had to do what was right, and and taking maximum security down was the right thing to do. Talking with Mike Watchmaker of the Daily Racing Forum, uh, you want to keep up with what's happening? Read him. Go online or or buy it. And I, I like to actually still have ink on my hands. I have no problem folding the papers and reading them. By the way, I just kind boy, of... I thought I was a dinosaur. Wait, oh you, my goodness! You know what? I, I, I've made the digital transition, Kenny. I think you should too. <laughs> well, hey, look, I'm doing a podcast. <laughs> Good for you. Look at me. Look at me. I'm on podcasts. I'm on. I'm on uh, YouTube, Mike. How about that? Who knew? That's great. But but you know what I what I really like uh, most about everything is uh, it was funny at the very end. I got a, a, a through another mutual friend. He called me and said, "Hey, a buddy of mine was watching the race, the Derby, and he was disgusted. He turned it off, and then uh, uh, somebody called him. You know, thirty minutes later, and said, "Hey, you won because he had in, he had in his uh, he had boxed." country house and won about 11 grand wow i said now ain't wow. that america well you know that raises an interesting question and i don't know that anyone's actually looked into it but i wonder um you know and i guess you have to give it some time but i wonder how many uncashed winning yeah. tickets there were how many people thought that they lost and actually wound up winning and, and don't know it so yeah. uh that would be interesting to find out uh, let's put jay pridman on that 
Okay, all right. As if he doesn't have enough to do. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you and Jay are like the two busiest guys. They're all over the place. But, you know, but it is. I think that story will come out eventually, and I wonder how many people, how many losing tickets, or how many thought losing tickets were, have been picked up along the grounds, you know? Yeah. People mm-hmm. walking by, hey, wait, is that is that five bucks for kicks on Country House, five across? You know, I got friends that always put like five across on the longest shot, you know? I'm sure there's several of those. And everybody thought stupors were a thing of the past. Look at that. That's it's not. See, that will never that will never ever get out of horse racing, will it? No. I, well, as long as there are still people at the racetrack, unfortunately, uh, people still go to the racetrack. Yeah. And, and this racing season, Mike, what's been your take on it all? And, and you know, I I think at this stage. I don't know. I, I thought at one time, remember the mare reproductive problems and uh, mares were aborting their babies and there was, you know, the grass was poison for the worms and uh, that's going back, gosh, two decades now almost. Uh, that was a terrible year. But I, I don't mm-hmm. think we've ever seen anything like this with all the problems of Santa Anita, the problems still at Santa Anita, the controversy of the Derby. Uh, you know, this is, this is going to be one for the record books that's uh, not one that people want to see in a record book. No, it, it's not. And and what's going on at Santa Anita is it's uh, it's very painful to watch. I mean, because it's it's one of our greatest racetracks, and it's uh, it, it's just a beautiful facility. And I I hate to see it happen. And and you know anyone who's involved in the game you know has an affinity and love for the horse. Uh, even even jaded handicappers like myself right. and. Uh, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, we just are not doing a very good job of getting the message out to the general public on that. Um, and we're not speaking with a unified voice. But I think, you know, one thing that is sort of flying under the radar here, and I, I, I'm noticing it uh, more so this year than in, even uh, in recent years, uh, is, is the, the declining foal populations, and um, it, it's really playing havoc with field size, and it's playing havoc uh, with with depth uh, in terms of good horses. And, uh, you know, I do this thing every week called the Watchmaker Watch, where I rank uh, the top 10 in each division, and, and there are some divisions where it's really, really difficult to come up with number eight, nine, and 10, because there's, there's so little depth that you're actually, you know, I have to hold my nose and like, you know, put a couple of allowance level type horses uh, in there. And it's, uh, it's something that I've, I'm noticing more this year than I, and I ever have before. There, there are some divisions where depth is, is, is really, really a, a major issue. Uh, and you know, we have other divisions where, where depth's great. Um, but, uh, uh like the turf male division, for example, I mean, bricks and mortar, it, it if you if you were forced to vote for a horse of the year at this on this yeah. particular date, it would probably be Bricks and Water, who's the top turf male by a wide margin in this country. But once you get by him and 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 you know the the promise of Catholic Boy, who's now going to be focusing on dirt races, you know when you're talking about really good turf males, you're talking about turf sprinters like World of Trouble and Improvis. I mean, because there aren't a lot of other good, reliable, consistent, you know, middle distance to longer distance mm-hmm. stakes turf males in this country. And it's, uh, that's just one division where, where we have a, a stark problem. Um, so, uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned, you know, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, the public perception of the game and what happened in the, in the, in the Kentucky Derby and what's been happening at Santa Anita. But I'm also concerned, uh, long term about declining full populations and the effect that it's having not only in the stakes uh, uh, divisions but uh, uh, also on the day to day offerings. I mean, you know, you, you, a lot of small fields are not particularly appealing uh, to a lot of uh, horse players, and and I get it. I mean, you know, and the and the day to day product is suffering as well. And that's uh, we're talking with Mike Watchmaker of the Daily Racing Forum. Great point about that. Even looking at like the top 10 in this NTRA poll, top 10, you know, all the horses, uh, I have trouble. Not that you know me, I've always had trouble, but when you get, <laughs> but you know, when you do start saying, okay, now really, how much difference is there between like number eight and number 14? You know, if you start listing like six, seven, eight horses, who do you put in those bottom three spots? 
Right. And, and, right. In, in all divisions. I mean, I can't get excited about a whole lot of horses. I mean, I was excited about the Met Mile. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was excited about the whole day, actually, at the, at the Belmont. And, right. and I, I guess going forward, who we have uh, that you get excited about? Matoli, McKenzie. Uh, you know, we mentioned bricks and mortar. Uh, what's Catholic boy going to do next? Uh, who, who else is out there for those that, that should just keep an eye on who could be a, a, a budding star or a star that'll continue to rise? Well, I think Guarana, uh, for sure. I mean, she was just oh, yeah. sensational winning the acorn. And I, I know that, um, she very deaf, deftly, uh, got to the inside, the best part of the racetrack uh, early in the race. And, the ironic thing about it is, is Jose Ortiz, Jose Ortiz rode Garana in the acorn and he got her to the inside fairly quickly. And then she only went around surrogate the Empress. Um, and Jose Ortiz was hostile to ride her in Tacitus, who was five wide around the track in the Belmont. But yeah. that's, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I still can't figure that out. But, you know, even if Garana for a time in the acorn was on the best part of the racetrack, that performance was just stunning uh, for a Philly to do that in only her second career start off a maiden win that, albeit was a monster maiden win, still just a maiden win in the slop. Um, and now she's running on a dry racetrack against the Kentucky Oaks winner. And she made the Serengeti Empress, that Kentucky Oaks winner, you know, look helpless by comparison. And it was just, she went from a one time, uh, one start maiden winner to the top three year old filly in the country and the 133 and change it took to run, to run the acorn. Uh, and, and she is, uh, somebody to be really excited about going forward. You mentioned Matoli. It's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, what Steve Asmussen and the owners of that horse do going down the road. Because, first of all, I thought he was a fortunate winner of the Met Mile. I don't want to rain on his parade because, uh, you know, it was the first time in his life going as far as a mile. But McKinsey was the best horse in the Met Mile. He got stopped in upper stretch and had to angle back inside. That was when he had already begun his rally and he had to start his rally all over again. And he was just eating the totally up in the late stages. Um it, but it'll be interesting to see what Matoli's connections do because it sure to me looked like the mile was about it for him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so what are they going to do with him now? I guess point for the Breeders' Cup dirt mile, maybe. Well, what are your races do you run in? Well, probably the four go at Saratoga, I mean, which is a seven furlong race. Outside of that, I'm not sure what you do with him. Uh, McKinsey's got a ton of options. Uh, Midnight Bizu is uh, in the absence of Bottom Boy Girl. Um, is is a very interesting filly. You know, she's now eight for eight at a mile and a sixteenth, and zero for four going longer than a mile and a sixteenth. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what she does. But then again, there's not a lot of depth in the older dirt female division, and she's going to catch a field going a mile and eighth in a stake race that that she's just going to have to win. Um, you know, bricks and water, terrific horse, Catholic boy going back to the dirt adds some much, much needed um, uh, depth to the older dirt male division. Um, and the turf female division is a tremendous division. I mean, rushing fall was, was brilliant winning the just the game. Mm -hmm. um, she's only lost once in her entire career and the defending champion in the, in the division sister Charlie hasn't even run yet this year. Right. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what she does when she comes back. But when she comes back, she's going to find a very, very tough division. I mean, she, she's even in her own barn. I mean, Chad Brown trains <laughs> rushing fall. He trains sister Charlie. He trains Homerique, who won the New York. He trains Sh Competition of Ideas, who was a narrowly beaten second in the New York. He trains Rimska. I mean, he, he's got like every decent turf female in the country, save one or two. Um, it's it's quite amazing, actually. But uh, And he also trains Bricks and Water, just, just to be, you know. And Garana. And Garana. Because he's so. got nothing else to do. Yeah. You know, he thought he'd pick up a three-year-old filly along the way. <laughs> Along the way, yeah. <laughs> you know, for Chad, that was a little emotional. I interviewed him right after that acorn, and of course, with Ghost Sapper, and you know, going back with Bobby Frankel, uh, the great mm -hmm. trainer and who's his mentor. I think he was a little emotional after the acorn because of that, all that tie-in. You know, I mean, uh, as well, emotional as Chad gets, I'm not saying he was crying or anything, but you know, I could tell that that really was special. Not just she was special in the win, but because of all the connections uh, tied in there, a little little history lesson going on with him. 
I, I think that's really actually kind of cool. Um, and, uh, you know, because of the ghost zapper connection and, uh, you know, what a racehorse ghost zapper was. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, was, he was tremendous. I mean, grade one level from six furlongs to a mile and a quarter. I mean, he was just a tremendous horse. And he says that Garana is a lot like, is very reminiscent of ghost zapper. Yeah. I mean, you know, if she's half as good as he was, then she's going to have some career in front of her. But she already had some career in front of her. I mean, uh, uh, what 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 an acorn that was. So, um, um, it, you know, that three-year-old Philly division is very good, Kenny. I mean, you know, they got they – got, there are three-year-old Philly sprinters that are just tremendous. I mean, break even when the Jersey girl stakes the day after the Belmont uh, at Belmont Park. Uh, Kofefe, who was so sensational winning the Miss Preakness uh, down at Pimlico uh, around Preakness time. Bellafina, who was the favorite in the Oaks. Now she's going to cut back to shorter distance races. Mm -hmm. A race like the test of Saratoga is just going to be uh, an absolute war. I mean, that's a race really, really uh, to look forward to. The girls are beating the boys right now, I think, in the three-year-old division. Uh, in terms of entertainment value, yeah. no question about it. No, no question. No question. Is do you think if 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 Mr. West had called you up and said, Mike, uh, I respect you as a handicapper and all your experience, what should I do with uh, what what should I do if he's healthy and all that with maximum security? If that if that question were asking me of the Derby, I mean, I have my opinion. I've said it a few times. What would you have told him? Well, uh, it, it depends on when he called because. Um, you know, I, I, it, I, I think that he should have run on the Preakness. Uh, Me too. But uh, he didn't. And uh, by turning his back on the last two legs of the Triple Crown, um, you know, it, he sort of abdicated his, as far as I'm concerned, he abdicated his leadership role in the division. And now there's a lot of rumblings that he's not even going to run on the Pegasus, which was uh, intended to be his prep for the uh, the Haskell. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, but Mr. West has a horse. Let's not forget about game winner. Oh, yeah. um, he was the champion two year old male last year. Uh, and I was you know, I wasn't particularly especially taken with him last year. I actually liked improbable in Bob Baffert's barn better than game winner. Uh, but game winner has been just brutally unlucky this year. Uh, he, he had horrendous trips in the Kentucky Derby, in the Santa Anita Derby. Uh, he had a, a major excuse in, in the Rebel uh, when he was beating the nose. I mean, uh, by Omaha Beach, who I, 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 I regard so highly. Uh, you know, game winner just just needs a little. He just needs a helpful ride. I mean, uh, you know, just a fair, even trip. I mean, not even helpful, just just a fair trip. And he's gonna string some wins together, and and in in a division that uh, is going to be won in races like the Haskell and Travers and Pennsylvania Derby, and how these three year olds run against all their males in the Breeders' Cup Classic. A game winner is still a very, very live player here, even though he has not actually won a race. And here we, you know, we're talking in the middle of June. Uh, it's uh, uh, the whole division. Now, there are a lot of live horses, but I think game winner is a very, very dangerous horse. Um, he's just been extremely unlucky this year. Hey, that's a great point. And, uh, you know, you figure you're not going to discount Baffert out. Somewhere along the line, something's going to happen. I mean, I think Improbable has been like the beaten favorite in his last four races. Yeah, he has. He's been disappointing. I mean, he didn't. Uh, he didn't have an excuse really in the in the Derby. I thought, uh, you know, the the Preakness just because it was, uh, you know, attrition had taken such a toll in the field in the Preakness that, you know, the Preakness was going to be a race that he would win, and he just he just didn't, you know, fire at all. So there's something not quite right there. I mean, I know that he's a better horse than he showed in the first two legs of the triple crown. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, at some point he's, he's, he's going to win another big race, but, you know, I, I, I think, you know, he's got, he's got a much higher hill to climb than some other members in, in this uh, three-year-old male division. Talking with Mike Watchmaker, the brilliant handicapper for the daily racing form. And I want to ask, do you have favorite horses over the years, horses that you just, uh, you know, maybe that maybe might not have been great horse. You know, obviously, everybody, yeah, I love Secretary at Seattle Slough. Yeah, I got that. But, you know, there's been a horse or two or three out there that you just have a great memory of that uh, you always enjoyed watching them compete. Well, uh, um, well, yes and no. Um, I, I, to me, you know, the, my all-time favorite horse was Secretary. Of I mean, course. I, you know, he just, he, just, he just did things that uh, – made your, made your jaw drop. And, 
um, what was what was uh, so impressive about Secretary, and it's kind of funny, uh, I, I'm, I'm a third generation gambler and I started going to the track because my dad was at the track every day. And um, uh, and I started going when I was 12 years old in, in, this, in May of 1968. Um, and back then you had to be 21 to get into the racetrack. Um, <laughs> but Bill Vec, the, the baseball impresario from the Chicago White Sox, Eddie Goodell fame, he headed up a group that bought Suffolk Downs, and one of the first things he did was get legislation passed uh, to allow minors into the racetrack when accompanied by an adult. And um, I started tagging along to the track with my dad, and if, if you think I'm a jaded horse player, you should have seen him. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, um, Secretariat was the one horse I ever heard him term monster yeah. um and uh that that had an i mean not only did secretariat have a massive impact on me but the fact that he impressed my father was just triply impressive to me so um he i mean he did stuff that was amazing and you know people talk about his belmont stakes and you know the the, the, the great performance in the whole floor the move on the first turn in the pre stakes but you know, it was it was like winning the Marlboro Cup over that star studded field yeah. and then, you know, running giant races on the turf after that. I mean, just like, you know, winning two of the biggest turf races, uh, you know, that that, that we had at the time. The, the, uh, you know, it beating horses like Ten Tam on the turf was just like absurd. I mean, uh, he just was an, an incredible horse and and. Nobody can touch him as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I have, you know, I've had stable pets all, all over the course of the years. And, right. you know, and it, uh, the assorted $5,000 claimer that, you know, uh, helped me cash a bet and, and <laughs> help, help pay my rent for the next month, you know, that kind of stuff. But uh, but the one horse that really, you know, I, 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 I unabashedly gush over is Secretariat. Do you remember your first big hit? Were you with your dad when you had that? And you know what? And it's your age. You know, when we're all teenagers, the first big hit could have been like 50 bucks, 100 bucks. I mean, that you know, that's money when you're 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Well, uh, I was much younger than that. I don't, Kenny, I really don't remember my first big hit. Um, but I remember the first time I actually went up and made a bet. Uh -huh. And and it was, um, it was at Scarborough Downs in Maine. And, uh, you know, they, they raced a thoroughbred meet there during the summer at night and the mosquitoes were big enough to throw saddles on. <laughs> and, and I, I think that the, the, every race was a $1,200 claimer and 1200, not 12,000, 1200. <laughs> right. And, um, I was at Scarborough Downs and, and I'll never forget it. I mean, I, I think I was probably 14 or 15 and looked every bit of 10 <laughs> and my, you know, it was late in the night and there was nobody left in the racetrack. And my father said, why don't you go up and make, make the bet on this race? And I'd never done it before. And, and, um, I said, you gotta be 21. I, you know, I used the guy's going to embarrass me. He's going to tell me, no, he said, just go ahead and do it. So this is all happening in front of a mutual teller and the mutual teller sees what's going on. My dad hands me like five or $10 to bet on a horse. And I look at the mutual teller and the mutual teller starts waving me towards the window. And it was like, I look back and that it's like, he's the devil. Come on, <laughs> little guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I do remember that very, very vividly. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great memory. <laughs> Mosquitoes with saddles. I like that. Yeah, really. They were giant. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you brought up Bill Veck a minute ago. One of my all time favorite books about sports, sports figures, sport, whatever sports you want to uh, go with the genre, is Veck is in Wreck. I love that uh -huh. book. I, I just, uh, I was a big fan of Bill Veck as, uh, on the baseball. And you mentioned Eddie Goodell. Yeah. You know, right. We're the guys that were, and people should Google this stuff and look it up if you don't know what we're talking about, because I don't know if there's better, ever been anybody more innovative in, in team sports, much less just baseball. And now you mentioned like getting minors into the, to the racetrack than Bill Vec. He was quite the visionary. Well, I don't know if he actually wrote the book, uh, Kenny, but there was, uh, he might have written the book, but there was a book about his stewardship of Suffolk Downs which lasted, I don't know, uh, three or four, or maybe five years or something like that. And the name of the book is called 30 Tons a Day. Oh, okay. And and it's a great book. It's hysterical. It's well worth reading. But 30 Tons a Day, the name of the book comes from because that's 
that was the uh, the weight of the horse manure that was coming out of Suffolk Downs at the end of the, at the end of every day. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Okay. Now I'm writing that down. Thirty tons a day. Okay, that, there's yeah. there's on my something to read this summer. If I, I hope I'm, you can find it. I you know, you I, can find it. the way things are anyway in these days, isn't it amazing all the stuff you can find? And and does it? Has all this technology affected you as a handicap, or do you still just go out there and look? And like you talk about track bias still being very important, how the day's playing out. You always pay attention to that as well as anyone. I mean, has technology influenced that much, or is it still basically, you know, look at the numbers, look at the track that day, you know, maybe look at the horses as they come onto the track? Well, you still have to roll up your sleeves and do the work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not breaking rocks in the sun. But it is time consuming work where, you know, you've got to watch replays. You've got to, uh, you know, do your speed. I do my own speed figures out for decades. And, and you know, you, you got to put in the time and the effort and, and the work to do the handicapping because, you know, that that's the foundation on which everything's built on. Your your opinion is built on that. Your your recognition of track bias is built on that, because if you haven't handicapped a card and have expectations of how horses work, should run and then see the racetrack toy or monkey with those expectations mm -hmm. uh and and make horses run better than they should have run or make horses run worse than they should have run and it's because of the race i mean that's how you make these how you reach these conclusions but technology has been uh, a, a, a tremendous help i mean you know you, you used to have to keep stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of old racing forms to go back and and look up uh you know uh, the pps of past horses and charts and stuff like that and you can do that all now here comes the shameless plug with drf formulator I mean, yeah. you know you put you go into formulator you can pull up pps of the horses every horse run against you can see most replays uh, replay access is so much better than it, it, it ever it's so much better now than it's ever been um you know you could go back and you know uh, look at charts and, and see all kinds of uh, trainer stats you know back in the old days you know the guys would be slaving over uh finding out how trainer x did with first time starters and you know you had a sense that trainer x did well with first time starters which it never really knew mm -hmm. and now that that kind of information is almost taken for granted whereas it wasn't that long ago uh, only a precious few mm -hmm. uh, had that information and what it's done is it's made the game more difficult um <clears throat> Because now the betting public, you know, to, to a certain extent, has become more sophisticated. And, and uh, you know, let's face it, that when I make a bet, I'm betting against the rest of the betting public. I'm not betting against the house. I'm betting right. against everybody else. And many of those people have done their work, too. Uh, of course, that, you know, the, the, the sophistication of the betting public uh, does vary from circuit to circuit. And, you know, even though I live in New York and uh, the New York Race Association is my home circuit, uh, every now and then I will adopt a lesser circuit as sort of my guilty pleasure yeah. uh, because it's always fun um, to bet, you know, on cheap racing. It, it reminds me of my youth and and um, but also to be involved in pools with, quote unquote, less sophisticated players. So, uh, um, you know, it's it's fun to do that, too. You still got to put the work in, but technology has been a tremendous help. And like I said, I mean, DRF formulators are big, big big part of that and you know I, I can't imagine any handicapper out there worth the salt that isn't at least familiar with formulator and if you if you're not right. you, you really owe it to yourself to give it a try because it's 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 amazing wholeheartedly agree that and keep up with mike and and the watch list there uh, of the horses and the divisions uh for those people that just kind of casually follow racing after the triple crown I think that if you do that, you'll be able to at least be informed enough to talk to your friends about it and maybe then look into it more and you might want to go out and make a few bets yourself. Look at that. We're doing we're doing better work than the NTRA promoting this sport right now. <laughs> Just give us the reins, Kenny. <laughs> yeah, we, we wish. Mike, I can't thank you enough for being with me, my friend, and uh, I, I do want you to come back. Oh, great pleasure, and any time I'd be happy to. All right, thank you. Mike Watchmaker from the Daily Racing Forum, as good as it gets here. You want to talk about handicapping and what he just said about the formulator and everything else with the DRF. We'll have more of the Horse Racing Show right after this.
Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. I'm Kenny Rice. Thank you for tuning in to YouTube or from whatever outlet you're listening or watching us. Ahmed Farid impressed me with the quick pickup of his knowledge of horse racing. He covers all kinds of sports uh, for NBC. He's worked at Major League Baseball Network. And he also actually listens to this show. So there, that's all the pluses. That's how much I like the guy already. And Ahmed joins us now. Welcome into the show. Thank you, Kenny. It's a good. I'm a loyal, loyal listener. A loyal listener to the podcast for sure. Wow. You and what was this year like? I mean, they kind of, I would say, throw you into the fire, but you jump right into horse racing. You've covered every other sport out there, it seems, and now this year you cover the Triple Crown Trail, and then go all the way through the Triple Crown, and just kind of your overall take on the horse racing world. Yeah. So for the past six years or so, I've been out in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and was covering a bunch of different sports there, Warriors and 49ers and Raiders, and the last couple of years doing the San Francisco Giants pregame, postgame. Um, but then picked up, moved the whole family out east to the national headquarters for NBC in Connecticut there. And for the first three months, they said, okay, we're going to stick you on a couple of things that you might not be too familiar with. One of them is horse racing. And they go, how much do you know about horse racing? I go, very little, very little. And they go, perfect. You're perfect for the job. <laughs> um, no, but so they, they threw me in it. And the great thing is they've given me so much time to just dive into it and study it and talk to a lot of people. I've hung out with Randy Moss and Jerry Bailey extensively on the, the road to the Kentucky Derby with all the different preps that were out there working on those shows and so it's been it's been hard i'm not gonna lie i mean obviously there are so many intricacies to the sport and that doesn't just have to do with the horses the trainers and the jockeys and the ownership groups all with their separate stories and i always tell people people always ask me they go do you ever get do you ever get nervous on tv and i go you know what i never really sweat unless i am a little uncomfortable with the subject matter and so you know i apologize kenny for the last three months, I've been sweating a little bit more on TV than I have the last couple of years, but uh, but the team has been great. You've been great to work with, and you guys have helped me so much. And so I've, I've learned a lot, and I really appreciate what I've gotten to know about the sport so far. Well, I got to tell you, I never knew you were sweating. I mean, you pulled it off great. <laughs> If you, you know, you were like the duck in the water, right? If whatever you were doing underneath the water, it didn't show on the surface. You know, you're just smoothly right. going along. Uh, you know, one thing that I thought with horse racing and with the baseball that you've covered, I don't know if there's two more sports that have more stats. I know every sport's got a lot of stats, but baseball and horse racing, maybe that goes back to when they were the heyday sports back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. But there's a lot of stats to read on every race and every ball game out there. I, lo I love that you brought that up because that was one of the first things I thought about just from being a baseball guy. And I worked back in the day at MLB Network for a couple of years as well. That was one of the first things I, I realized is how much, you know, we pour over the stats in both both different sports. And you're oftentimes in, in baseball, you're, you're working with, with small sample sizes. And that is the name of the game in horse racing where you're trying to extrapolate as much knowledge as you can from as little information as you have. Sometimes it's just kind of the, the, the last race, which was not against good competition a month and a half ago or three months ago. And so that I, that was one of the things I noticed right away was just how similar they are into, into trying to pour over the numbers and trying to figure out what numbers matter and what numbers don't. I think that's been a real eye-opener for me is that I, I look at some of these and go, hey, this was a great race for the horse. He looks great. And like, yeah, yeah, you know what? You didn't come out of it very good. There's, there's a whole lot more to it than just the numbers. But still, at the same time, for numbers people, uh, I think it there's a lot to offer there. That, that's a great point. And, uh, yeah, I think sometimes there's too many. My, my favorite baseball stat now, I, I don't know, it's kind of like, you know, in horse racing, and as you know, they, they talk a lot about the time of the race. There's an old trainer, Charlie Whittingham, the late great trainer, Charlie Whittingham, won a couple of derbies and everything else uh, along the way. Uh, he had, uh, as only a tough ex-Marine like he was could say, he said, time only matters when you're behind bars. <laughs> it, did, did you win the race? That's really all I care about. And uh, yep. and I think that when it's this whole baseball stat, um, that, that fascinates me, how fast did it leave the park? It's a home run. I, I don't know. Right. Well, and, you know, and I think there is, you know, there is a fine line between how much do we want to analyze it and how much do we want to make this a science and how much do we want to just appreciate the beauty of the sport? Yeah. You know, how much do we just want to appreciate what is happening with great athletes, with the baseball players, great athletes, whether they're horses and jockeys. And I think there, there is a conflict there. And I, I saw with baseball the past, 
you know, few years is where you get into too many stats and numbers. You're like, you're taking the, the art and the joy of our sport away. Uh, just enjoy, just enjoy it for what it is. This was a, a horse that, yeah, maybe doesn't have the best numbers and the buyer speed figures, not very high, but he's a winner and he's a champion and he digs deep. And there's something to be said about enjoying the sport at that level as well. Did you enjoy going out in the mornings and walk around the barns? I mean, cause it's kind of like its own separate world. It's a lot different than being around the batting cage before practice or watching a shoot around before basketball. It's kind of, it's, it, I don't know how to describe it other than say, I haven't been around and I've been around this sport a lot, but I haven't been around it. Any other sport that has that, that kind of own little culture of the backside that horse racing has. Yeah. And it's got its own pace in the morning. Yeah, when I first started and I went out to, uh, Golf stream just to kind of scout it out with Rob Highland, who is uh, our, our producer for the the Triple Crown, and with Jerry and with Randy, and they get, they said, "You want to go out to the barns with us?" And I go, yeah, "Absolutely." I go, "What time are you you getting up?" And they go, "Well, we'll be at the, your door at six o'clock." And I go, "Well, on second thought, maybe I don't want to go <laughs> that early." Um, no, but we did, and I did every every stop we went on in, in Baltimore. I did it in, in Louisville, and then this past one at Belmont, I, I got up and went to the barns. And you're right, there's there's just an interesting pace to the whole thing. And what struck me was how different every trainer was and how they, different they operated. You know, Bill Mott, every time we saw him, he was on top of a horse riding around, obviously very involved. Todd Pletcher had his you know, giant staff and a well, uh, well put together office. Um, it, it was just, it, they're all so different. You know, Jason's service is different than, than the rest of the Chad Brown and they, but it all they all have their different things that they do that that leads them to success. And there's not it's not a cookie cutter. It's real obvious when you go around, you take a look at all the barns and how they're all acting. And um, Dwayne Lucas was just sitting out, just talking to people, sitting out in his chair and just <laughs> lounging around and taking it all in. So I thought that was really cool to see. It, it helped me learn who these people were first and foremost. I got to know them a little bit better. And so when I saw them, I had a little background. But just it struck me how different they approached the sport uh, from each and every one of them that, that, that you know that's an interesting observation and, and that's why as i said earlier when we first started the show i said uh we're talking with ahmed farid of uh, nbc sports and i said i want to get ahmed's opinion on it because for those of us that's been around it as with any sport that you're around a lot of times you forget things you take things for granted you don't forget them but you take it for granted and that's why I like to get a fresh perspective. And what you just said, I thought about it. I said, yeah, I mean, I don't know very few trainers that I could say are, are, are like the same guy. Uh, I can say right. that about a lot of coaches I've covered, basketball coaches, football coaches. You know, they're, they're kind of cut from the same cloth, a lot of them. And except for this uh, love of horses that naturally you'd have to have, uh, most of the approaches are, are very unique for, the, for all the trainers in this sport. Yeah, yeah, and and it was it was really obvious. Like I said, walking around and and seeing that, and just kind of watching how much they care for all the animals. I mean, it wasn't uncommon to see a, a couple times we saw trainers, you know, combing the the horses and getting some of the the dead hair off, and it just kind of how they they interact with them. They always wanted us to meet the horses. Kenny McPeak was like, "You want to meet him? You want to go over here? You want to meet the horse?" <laughs> yeah. And so. And so we would, we'd go and we'd go and we'd meet the horse. And my gosh, Randy Moss, I mean, Jerry loves horses. Randy Moss really loves horses. Oh, like yeah. he would be like, all right, it's time to go. All right, Randy. Okay. Cut it short. You know, we're, we're good here. Um, but that's, the, that is just what it is. And you feel it immediately when you're there in the barns. And so that's, what's a little you know, disappointing to me. And, you know, I was an outsider, you know, three, you know, four months ago, and it's still in some respects, I'm still an outsider, but, when you hear all this talk about how, uh, you know, if you don't see the sport, you don't understand how much these horses are cared for and how much they're loved. And you can see it every time I go to the barns, just because of what I just told you. They say, let's go talk to them. Let's go meet them. You want to see them? You want to go over? It? Yeah, absolutely. We want to hang out with, with the horses as much as we want to talk to you about them. And, and the thing is, when the trainer tricks you into going for the horse that likes to bite, they did that to me a lot <laughs> when I first started. You want to pet him? Sure. <laughs> it's kind of like, the, hey, you want to pet that dog? And he starts growling at you. Oh, wait, no, I don't want to pet him. I am still like, I stand so far behind. I'm like behind Randy and Jerry every time we go. I, and I just don't know where to stand sometimes, you know, right side, left side. There's so much things like that. So I just try to like, as much as I can, I'm, I'm like in Randy's hip pocket when we're out there. 
Uh, that's a good place to be. I, I'm kind of the same yeah. way. And, and I do apologize. I was supposed to go out to you with one morning with you guys, and I slept in. I got up like seven thirty and went out. You know. You know, it's funny. And and uh, I was talking to Mike Tarico, who Mike's been a huge help to me because he yeah. was uh, he was new to it just a couple of years ago as well. But he gave me a lot of tips that helped him uh, learn and become familiar with all the terms. And and he he heard that I was going out to the barns. He goes, you know what? By the second year, you won't be doing that. You you won't. <laughs> he's like, you'll be sleeping <laughs> in like the rest of us. You know? <laughs> He'll be picking up he's the done. cell phone and calling the trainer like about eleven thirty in the morning. I know. Exactly, exactly. But so far, I, I like it. As long as I can sleep, you know, maybe the other day a little bit later, uh, it's, it's been a whole lot of fun for me. As with any sport, and again, the, the many that uh, Ahmed Farid has covered in his career and is covering now for NBC, you know, again, like you say, there's a lot of times that we go into a sport knowing enough about it, but you can research it and you can meet the people. And even after you've covered a sport for a long time, you still research it and meet the people, don't you? I mean, there's some very basic reporting skills that are always going to be out there there's always more there's always more to learn and and the sport is changing you know with baseball it's changing it, it before our eyes with the different general managers who are involved and how they approach different strategies of an opener you know your starting pitcher is not going seven innings anymore he might be going an inning in the third you know so yeah. it's, it's always changing and, and I, that's obvious here with with horse racing um but i, I i've gone into it because I know that there have been, I mean, there's everyone I'm working with, you included, Donna, uh, Randy, Jerry, have been involved in it pretty much, you know, their whole lives. And so there's a depth of knowledge there that I will, I will never have. So what I have to do every time is I go in here, I'm saying, you know what, I'm excited to cover the sport. I, I enjoy it. And I'm going to be curious about it. I'm not going to try to pretend I'm an expert out there next to Lafitte, who's been around it his whole life and knows mm -hmm. so much. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, be enthusiastic about talking about it, and I'm going to be curious about every different aspect of it. And I think every once in a while that does help, you know, from the Commons fan standpoint, watching at home that might not be as familiar as you guys are with, with the sport. There are these questions that you think is obvious, but to me it's not that obvious. Right. So we, we get it out there and get it out to a general audience. And, and you know, still the best question, even for those of us who have been around whatever the sport is, what happened? Why'd you do this? I mean, it's a pretty yeah. simple question. You know, I like to hear what the guys actually doing it are doing it. You know, what, what yeah. do they got to say? And that leads me yeah. back to baseball, Ahmed. This, what fascinates me these days is like you mentioned about the starting pitchers. May not even get through an inning. And, and, it's, and, and I just always kind of grin a little bit at, at when, they, when they're just going so excited about a, a pitcher that has a complete game. Maybe I'm too old school. I, I'm with the St. Louis Cardinals of the Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood. That's my team. That's I've been a Cardinals fan. Uh, it always fascinates me. You know, like uh, all the attention given to a complete game, as if it had never happened before. <laughs> well, I think like last year, I, I believe in the National League, it was either one or two complete games led the league. Yeah. I, I don't know what it was. I don't think we've had a pitcher with ten or more complete games since. 2008 i think i was looking at it the other day i'm with you i miss it I, I, I love complete games i love no hitters you don't have a complete game you can't have a no hitter right. um and that is a huge piece of baseball history and what baseball is that is going away and i i'm bummed to see it now at the same time i, I understand it right. you, you you look at the numbers and you say okay it's the, the pitcher third time through the order is getting beat up and so we got to bring in a reliever we're, we're dumb not to so i get that I think it just creates another question of what, what what is the sport of baseball that we want? Do we want a sport that the pitcher only pitches a few innings, or do we want a sport where they're incentivized to go longer? And at that point, are you changing the rules? Do you try to do things to to make teams want to push their pitchers longer? Is there an incentive there for it? And so I think, you know, once again, like we were talking before, you look at horse racing over the last year, that horse racing is not a sport that has changed a whole lot, um, mm -hmm. you know, was for good and bad, you know, some of the medical practices we've seen through throughout the years. And so it's, I think it's always good to just take a step back and say, okay, is this the sport that we want? Is this the entertainment product that we want? And if it's not, we shouldn't be afraid to tweak some rules or, or change some things, even though inherently in this game, horse racing, baseball, it's not about change. It's about, this is the same thing we've been doing for tens of hundreds of years, but every once in a while you got to be like, okay, what's the smart thing to do with the rules of the game? And Ahmed Farid is getting ready for the NBA draft 
And you know, that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sounding like this guy sitting up in the back. You know, another thing that bothers me about the days. <laughs> but but you know, the one and done. Uh, yeah. I, I just am not a one and done fan for a lot of reasons, and one of them is the fact that. I think that the NBA quality overall, while we are seeing some of the best, I don't know if we've ever seen better shooters on one team uh, than obviously, you know, Curry, Durant, and Thompson on the Warriors. I- I've never seen three guys that could shoot like that on one right. team. You know, so we're seeing some spectacular things going on right now. I get all that. You know, Harden scores, you know, 60 points. His team loses, but he can score 60 points any night, it seems. But. Uh, you, you know, I, do, I think overall uh, there's a lot of weakness in the NBA because these guys don't have that college experience. And, and I know there's exceptions that step in, you know, but there's not that many LeBrons and Kobe's that are just ready to pop out of high school and, and just breeze through college for a year and play in the NBA, in my opinion, uh, other than like a Carl Anthony Towns or somebody like that. And, and But then you look at the other uh, 20 guys, 30 guys drafted and see what they're doing compared to those guys. Right, I know, and, and I am. I'm, I'm preparing for. We got this Roto World with with NBC Roto World. NBC teamed up. I got an NBA draft preview. So I'm looking at all the different one and dones, and I'm looking at, at next year the top the top prospects for next year, and they're all high school seniors who are going <laughs> to either play internationally for a year or come and play for a college for one year. And it's, I mean, it's definitely good. I think for the marketing standpoint, I, I don't know that there's a more famous player than Zion Williamson was this past no, year playing at, right. at Duke. Um, he's probably more famous than I don't know seventy percent of the NBA players. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm just throwing, I think you're throwing right. that out there. So, I mean, as far as a marketing standpoint for some of the superstars, I do think it's probably good for them. Um, but yeah, you do you do wonder about some of these guys that slipped through the cracks and would they have gotten more, not necessarily better training because it's hard to argue that they would they don't get good training on a G level team if they're playing pro basketball, mm-hmm. um, the D league if they're playing all the time. But they might just not get the right attention or, or the attention they need, and they're a late bloomer. And maybe at that point the NBA team has moved on. Where if you're a four year college player, the coach is not moving on because he's your guy, and you're trying to win every single season with with you. So I, there's definitely something to be said. You know, good and bad with the current system, but um, but uh, for a few of those players, man, I think it has has helped them. Ahmed, mean, you cover everything. I mean, do you get a break now after the draft? Do, you, do the, the NBC give you some time off? I hope. I do. Um, I, I yeah, I'm taking some vacation. I've got uh, yeah, the NBA draft preview, and then I'm doing some rugby in the fall. We got the Rugby World Cup in the fall, so another sport that I'm trying to rack my brain and learn as uh, as quickly as possible that uh premier league soccer in the in the winter as well so basically i'm it's like i'm in college again kenny it's <laughs> like i'm taking four credit hours of horse racing three of soccer and and just trying to trying to pass and move on to the next level <laughs> <laughs> the rugby game i saw and i called for NBCSN a few years ago i worked with david gibson the producer on it was yeah. uh, was at uh, soldier field in chicago the u.s played australia and oh wow! And I forgot somebody couldn't do it. They were and and so they they bring me in, and uh, I was you know doing research. You know how it is. You cram. I'm trying to get all this in, and then suddenly I realized that it's full scale. This is 15 man. This is like you know this is everybody. This isn't seven on seven because I'd watch. Right. We were doing some seven on seven at that time. I thought hey, it's kind of a fun up and down sport, but uh, it it is different. I mean it's a different. Uh, rugby's a very the only sport though I don't understand still to this day is cricket. And I've tried to watch it, and yeah. I don't get cricket. I, I've been able to understand other sports, but I've never asked to cover cricket, nor will I ever be, I'm sure. But that, that's the one sport I still don't get. Everything else. And you I know what? And, and you know what's going to happen, Kenny? NBC is going to get cricket, and you and I are going to be doing it, play by play and color analyst. Well, if you're there, if you're there with me, Ahmed, I'll do it. You know, <laughs> if they put us together, I'll be glad to do it. Right, right. We'll call Rob right. Hyland. He listens to this show. We'll tell Rob we'll do that. We're he'll ready for the up. cricket. He'll put it on a, yeah, he'll put it on the platter for us. It'll be, yeah, no brainer. <laughs> well, listen, I really enjoyed uh, getting to meet and work with you, and, and I look forward again to doing it uh, again on the horse racing scene or some other sports scene with NBC, Ahmed. I really appreciate the friendship we've developed and uh, for being on the show today. Well, Kenny, like I said, you've, you've been so welcoming. It's made me feel a lot, a lot better as an outsider, and, and hopefully you know, we can talk. 10 years from now and say, wow, we've been doing this for, uh, for a decade, another a decade together, me with you. So, uh, that, that'd be great. And if we're still doing the show by that time, we'll probably have t-shirts and visors. <laughs> 
I like that. I heard that on the podcast. Like, oh, you're going to get a podcast visor, and I, I worked right up to you, and I said, we're getting I, I want one of those. I, I know. You I have them made. I want one. I was telling our guys here. I said, Ahmed may be the only person to listen to this today, but somebody <laughs> did listen today and brought up the visor, see? So that was great. That made my day. And, and I'll be honest with you, there's like been very few things that have helped me more than listening to podcasts, yours, and some other ones out there as well, because I feel like just hearing you talk about it for 30 minutes has been so valuable to me. And so I, I really have. I, I, I'm a listener. I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a listener. All right. Well, thank you. And I'll be checking in on your NBA draft preview, by the way. Yeah, it <laughs> sounds good, Kenny. All right. Ahmed Farid of NBC Sports joining us. Some more thoughts when we come back here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us. Welcome back in. This has been a fun show today. I like the inside of uh, Mike Watchmaker and telling all about you know, the divisions of the horses. He made a great point. There's not as many foals out there. The divisions aren't as deep as they used to be. There's exceptions. Overall, though, yeah, you go about five, six horses, seven deep. When you're talking about top ten, that's that's a great point. And uh, Ahmed Farid, I liked his input uh, in his first year of covering horse racing with NBC about what's going on on the track behind the scenes, how every trainer's different, have different approaches. You know, they're, they're similar, yet they're different. Thomas Kenny back with us, our researcher extraordinaire. And you were on the backside of Churchill Downs with me, Scott Hall, Ben Chaffins. We're all up there Derby week, a week before the Derby. Uh, what did you think about the backside of uh, watching the intricacies of horse racing that most people don't see? It's a bit of a different world, isn't it? It is. Not as glamorous as one might think. No, it's not, is it? A little smelly, too, isn't it? Just a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know one time... Uh, I was talking to a farrier, a blacksmith or a farrier about it, and uh, said, yeah, you know what? Smells like money to me. <laughs> when I come over here, I know I'm working. I know I'm making a job. But it is, it is a different culture, don't you think? Because you're into Absolutely. the gaming world, which is a kind of a foreign culture for me, okay? I've, I've watched some of it on TV now that they're showing these terms, but it's, you know, it's, it's just not my generation. It's something I don't quite get, but I appreciate the work that has to be put into it. It, it is a lot like any other sport. You do have to put in the time and the effort and actually sit down and practice and learn techniques if you want to you know, get to that top level where you can actually start making some money off of it. When you do, let us know. Well, okay. I have. Wow, look at that. See? Ah. Played a little game called Smite. Yeah? I doubt many people have heard of it, but there was a, a time and a place back in... Around 2015, when the game was really, you know, on the come up, uh -huh. starting to get a little popular, I was I was pretty good at it. I had a team going wow. that I captained, and we entered tournaments. Didn't win a whole lot of money. It was mostly, you know, like virtual currency for the game. But you know, look at you. We got a professional here, guys. Did you know that? No. Semi pro. That's pretty wow. good. Amateur enthusiast, maybe. That's pretty good. I, I get on these some of these games I play, not not like it's your level. I play like, you know, crossword puzzles and stuff. I get nothing. That's why I come in and do this show. Keeps me going. Keeps That's me. Right. <laughs> uh, Breeders' Cup. You know, Santa Anita, sadly, two more horses died. Um, one from a natural cause, a heart attack. I mean, sadly, that happens. Happens in life for everybody. On average, about three horses per 1,000 at a racetrack, according to veterinarian research, it's going to happen. But, 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 we know where this year's Breeders' Cup is still scheduled to be at Santa Anita. Whoa. That what? could be a problem. That could be. Have you heard any uh, rumors, Kenny? Actually, there's rumors going around. Now, if we were doing this like a reporting-type show, a news show, uh, you know, you'd, you'd qualify a lot of things, but this is more of a talk show. This is some speculation can, I, I think is fair. There, there are rumors out there right now that the Breeders' Cup, and I do have a source that has told me that the Breeders' Cup has already talked to Churchill Downs about a backup plant, that there's a chance that it'll be going to Louisville, Kentucky once again. And, uh, that's just the way it is uh, because, you know, there is 29 is the total now, not all those. Uh, you know, some of those would have happened anyway. They happen at racetracks. But but the attention given to it 
more attention has been given to this, sadly, than anything else in the sport this year is what's happened at Santa Anita. Yeah, all the you know deaths of natural causes. You know, like you said, they'd happen anyway, but that just compounds the statistic. You know, it does. That's it, and then that's what I said. If you know, what if three, four more happened during training this summer? Something like that, and and PETA has a running total of the numbers that they're putting up, and uh, there's you know a petition they're trying to get signed to, to have horse racing banned altogether. So it it's a very tough, delicate situation that I hate for horse racing in general. I hate for Santa Anita. It's one of my favorite tracks. It's a beautiful track. There's so much rich history there with you know all the horses that have raced from you know Sea Biscuit on, uh, but it is a situation I think that's getting more serious as to the future this year of the Breeders' Cup, and uh, I don't think it's stepping out to say there is speculation, and there are a lot of rumors about it might be coming. And then again, a, a good source uh, has already said that they, they had, Churchill Downs is aware, and they have made plans for backup if necessary. We're not saying it's ready to move yet, but if necessary, uh, that might be a move. And, and that, would, you know, that would just be a, a bad, bad year for, for horse racing, just continue on with that. But we should close on something positive, shouldn't we? Mark Cassie's a great guy, won those two legs triple crown. Bill Mott, great guy, won the Kentucky Derby. And all the way through, they've handled it with class and what has been controversial this year. New York treat you well? New York's good. New York's always fun. I uh, caught up with some friends, guys I worked with, used to work with, and we go to Peter Luger's in Great Neck and uh, Kevin Smallin and Jeff Simon and uh, Billy Matthews and I uh, went out and had a nice time. And then the rest of the time, you know, you spend around hotel rooms and tracks. It's glamorous, and yet I keep doing it. <laughs> and then, uh, so no cheesecake? Uh, for no, I'm trying to get in better shape. No cheesecake, buddy. How about that? Hey, good. I, don't I ate a anyway. big half raw steak. I mean, that was pretty good. <laughs> you know, I did indulge in that, so that was pretty good. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll order some. We'll have some cheesecake flown in. We'll get those when the racing visors come in. All right, thanks to Mike Watchmaker and to Ahmed Farid, our guest today. Thanks to Scott Hall, Ben Chaffins, and, of course, Thomas Kenny. Thank you for being with us. I'm Kenny Rice. We'll see you for Episode 22 next week on The Horse Racing Show.